Okay, so um, today we're going to continue chapter six, which is on economics. We're going to talk a little bit about chapter seven also, which is about political organization, because um, in societies like ours, which we have industrialism as our subsistence strategy, as you know, so in societies like ours or in agricultural societies, there are formal processes like in, in terms of government and leadership there are formal processes that usually economic exchange is governed by some kind of law or some kind of enforcement agency or something like that. So um, we're going to bring in a little bit of information from Chapter 7, which is about political systems and political organization. And we're also going to bring in a little bit of information from Chapter 8. We already have brought in some information from Chapter 8. I think that's the chapter it is on... on um, Social stratification, we already know what social stratification is because we have defined that in our notes and you've already had quizzes that, um, you know, and reaction paper opportunities to talk about social stratification. So anyway, um, this is mainly about the economics chapter, but you will notice that some of the discussion branches over into the political organization topic and the social stratification topic, okay? All right. So um, I think the thing that we ended with, well, when I looked at Hunter's notes, the things that we ended with um, on Monday were the, was household, the basic, that word household, which is a vocabulary word that is the basic economic unit in a society. We're going to pick up with that where we left off. But um, remember that when, when we say household in anthropology, we are not literally talking about a house and... We are just talking about the people who cooperate economically together as a unit, and you have an understanding. The relationship that you have, that understanding is um, that you can lean on each other, you can rely on each other, you participate in, I guess I'll use the word upkeep of each other, you participate in making sure that Food and other necessary subsistence materials are produced, distributed to the people you cooperate with, and consumed among all the people that, that you cooperate with. Okay, so production, distribution, and a consumption are um, processes that exist in every single, subsist every single um, economic system. Okay? The way things are produced, distributed, and consumed, you're going to have different customs and traditions about, or different answers to the question of how are things produced, how are things distributed, how are things consumed. The answers to those questions are going to be very different depending upon um, the subsistence strategy that you have, okay? And the enculturation process that we went through, and whether there's a surplus in your society or not, right? That changes the answers to those questions. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off with um, the concept of household. This is people. It's not really necessarily what the dwelling itself looks like. This is people who cooperate economically, okay? People who cooperate economically. Okay, so that's just you know, a shorter definition than what maybe you have in your notes already. Remember that even though we have this word house in the vocabulary word, that is the root word of that, of that word, but we're not literally talking about the dwelling itself. We're talking about the people who make up that, um, that lifestyle, okay? So a uh, household is the smallest, as you already know, smallest economic unit in society, in any society. You could also call it, since we're branching into the um, political organization chapter also, you can also call the household the smallest political or the smallest governing kind of unit in society, okay? Because there's going to be a power dynamic. There's going to be social stratification within households because just like we described division of labor in our subsistence strategies when we talked about those, there's different work that needs to be done for daily life to happen, and the work that exists in every society has a different value 
right? A different value to it. So if in my society, my job assigned to me based on my gender is childcare, and my husband's uh, or my partner's job is um, assigned to actually earn, in our case, in industrialism, earn a paycheck that we need to pay bills with, there's different social value placed on those two jobs. And so even within the household, we're there cooperating economically with each other, doing those two jobs that are assigned to us, but we have differing, we, we would have differing social value or prestige, like um, you'll read about in, in chapter, chapter six. Okay, so I drew a little picture on the board I think I did. I didn't see it in Hunter's notes, but did I draw y'all? Okay. I I'm didn't a, bother drawing it. Okay. All right. So let me draw a picture again on the board because you will see these um, these symbols again. As a matter of fact, the kinship and marriage and family chapter that we do, um, or the unit that we do, like after a midterm, um, you're gonna draw them a lot. You're gonna <laughs> you're gonna get so familiar with these things. You're gonna have nightmares about them. So um, so anyway, this is just an example of a household. Well, let me do a Yanomami household, because y'all read, um, you know, y'all read that for Project One. So, um, of course, household for Yanomami, you know from the organization of the village, the way it was described, there's not four walls and a roof and a privacy fence between each dwelling, right? So we're not talking about the dwelling, we're talking about the people who cooperate there. So, okay, so a triangle represents a male, okay, represents a male. And in this, we can call, this equal sign represents, um, that's supposed to be a circle and not an oval. Anyway, this equal sign represents um, a sexual union. You can call it a marriage, but marriages don't exist every single place in the world. And um, sexual unions do. And sometimes where marriages exist, sex is not part of them. It's not part of the customs associated with, with marriage in every place. Um, okay, so do Yanomami men have just one wife? No, they have multiple wives, as we read. So here is a way where you can show multiple wives. Here's a man, and this woman is married to him, and this woman is married to him. Now, is there a sexual union with each of these people in Yanomami culture? Would both of these wives maybe have this man's children? Yes, we know that. So here, let's give this wife, how many kids you want to, well, I've given her at least two. You want to limit her to two, or you want more? Okay. So you want them boys or girls? Or both? both? Both. Here's a boy, here's a girl. Okay? So the way you should interpret this picture is here is a man, here is a sexual partner, and from that sexual union, two children, two offspring have happened. A male and a female offspring. Okay? Let's give this sexual union one. Do you want it to be a male or a female? Hard decision. Female. Female, thank you. Hard decision. Gave him a great big old baby right there. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, yes. Uh, this is, this could be the people who, oh, this is a male, and of course these circles are females. Um, and, I, and I would want you to, when we get to this chapter, when we're talking about this, I want you to refer to females and males and not circles and triangles. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's hard, you know, put a triangle here. No, a male, right, is the triangle, and circles are females. So anyway, and you should interpret this as different generations. So here is one generation, and here is the descending generation. So these are the descendants of these people, okay? And, and we'll go over this in detail nauseating detail in, um, in a future unit, okay? So I'm drawing this because perhaps this is a very logical picture that represents the people who participate economically with each other and form a household. Now in Yanomami society, there might be literally in the little circle, what, what, what is it called, the little circle thing they live on? <laughs> can't remember the name of it right now. But anyway, there might literally be like no boundary between this hut and this hut. They share a roof. There might literally be no boundary and then another household with one man and one wife or one man and six wives, right? There might be 
another household just right here. And there's some cooperation going on. That's the custom. That's the economic customs that happen in Yanomami culture. However, um, these people are the ones that cooperate economically in the smallest unit that we can measure in society. Make sense? Okay. All right, this is called a nuclear family. We will discuss that further in future units. Okay, so let's look at the cooperation that can happen here, the division of labor that can happen here, the authority and the rule, you know, who has the, um, who has the decision making capacity. Let's look at that for a second. So um, in, in the case of the Yanomami, who, for instance, participates the most directly with producing food? The males, yes. So the males, the, the males produce food. There's the F represents, this is the food producer. What do the females do in terms of um, food production? <coughs> They, yes, they, they maybe participate in some foraging activities. We know that the Yanomami are horticulturalists, and that's why, that's why Paola said that the males do most of the food production, because they're horticulturalists, so they have one staple crop that the bulk of the calories come from, but there's lots of other calories that they get. They get it from foraging activities. So maybe the females participate in foraging activities. They're going to hunt or gather. The males might hunt also. But what else, what do the females do primarily with the, the plantains that they bring in? They, they're going to prep. They're going to be like the prep cooks, right? They're the prep. So they have a job. Their division of labor includes that they do have a great deal to do with the food supply, but it's not the general production of the food supply. It's one of the steps in the distribution of the food supply, right? So we've got production. We've got distribution. Who is going to con consume all of this stuff? Yeah. Everybody. So everybody in both generations, everybody in this household has to be a consumer. Does everybody have to produce at the same rate or distribute at the same rate? <coughs> no. Um, but and does everybody have to consume at the same rate? No is the correct answer here because maybe baby over here does not, definitely, baby does not need to eat as much as this guy because this guy is um, in the fields all day long, you know, maybe not all day long, but you know, the, this guy is in the fields and um, actually producing the food that everybody is eating. So this guy would need another allotment. You will read in chapter six about allocation of resources. So um, when you look at a society and you look at what's called a productive resource, production is one of our steps in any economic system, right? A productive resource in a horticulture society is going to be something like the hand tools that the males use to work the soil and to harvest and to tend the crop. A productive resource is going to be the land itself. A productive resource is going to be in, in a foraging society is going to be that which occurs in nature. A productive resource in um, agriculture is going to be the plow and the oxen or, you know, whatever that question on, there was a scenario about that on the quiz that you just got back. So whatever that scenario was that kind of gave you some key words, land definitely is a productive resource in agriculture. We have land ownership in, in agriculture for the first time. Right? So these productive resources, not everybody necessarily has control of or power over those productive resources in the same way, and that creates divisions. It creates power divisions within just one household, but also within society in general. Does that make sense? Okay, it looked like you had a question on your mind. Okay, so... Um, so yeah, so like for instance with pastoralists, um, the household is still, you know, it's going to represent something, something like this, that the household is the smallest economic unit of any society, regardless of what subsistence strategy that you have. But depending upon what subsistence strategy you have, the decisions about the economic cooperation that everybody in society has is going to be vastly different from one cultural system to the next. So... For instance, in our society, we do not have, most people in our society, in industrialism that is, most of us are, you know, hundreds of degrees separated from production of our food supply. Most of us, I did have a student one time work at the, um, 
what's it called? I think it's the Pilgrim's Pride uh, factory where they processed hogs. He's like, I'm only one degree separated from producing the food supply. Because he um, actually was a factory worker where they haul the hogs in and they slaughter them and process them right there in the factory. Most of us don't have those kinds of jobs anymore. Um, most of us, ha I mean, my teaching job, how far removed am I from the production of the food that I need to, uh, to consume to keep my, me and the other members of my household alive? I am so many, I mean, we just probably can't count. How, how even the culinary students <coughs> who are at the culinary school here um, studying how to prepare food and present it to us, the culinary students are part of the distribution kind of production processes, but unless you're doing farm to table, you're, which, you know, which is one of the ways that, um, that culinary students learn how to, how to be, or in the locavore movement or something like this, um, you're usually very far removed. If you are a chef at the Waldorf in New York City, you're extremely far removed from actually the production of that food. And you know, with the transportation, you might be serving, um, you know, who knows what you're serving, elk or some elk medallions or something at the Waldorf in, in, um, in New York. And you know, so that elk was you know, someplace in Utah when, um, you know, where the farmer was, was producing it or something, right? So it's, you're far, far removed from the sources of the food that you're using. Okay, so um, the household is the smallest economic unit of society. You can observe things like division of labor, and you can also observe things like power and prestige within a household. Authority would be power, prestige would be respect, right? So who in this household picture that I have, who probably holds the most power for decision making and who probably holds the most prestige for respect in this, in this structure? Which male? I have three, two males on this picture. In the first generation here. So the, the father, we're going to use that word for now. We have a different vocabulary word for the person who sires children in, um, in anthropology. We will learn it later, but right now we will use the word father. Um, so this guy in the first generation, who we said was in charge of doing the food in this particular case, you know, actually the food. Why? Why'd you pick him? He's the one that's mainly, uh, like, the most directly associated with the production of the food. Therefore, he has the more, most power, technically, because he's more directly responsible for that. Okay, y'all hear y'all hear that? So he, so you're picking him, and I guess I guess y'all you agree. On, okay, so you're picking him because we said in the division of labor, he's the one who's most in control of the production of the food. And even though these people contribute, um, these two people would not have as much power or, or authority or respect as this person does. Um, and certainly in Yanomami culture, we know about the custom of wife beating. So that's, you know, there and, and even the power and the respect thing that that represented in society when that went on, right? So we even have some of that information. So, so yeah, so these people do not have necessarily any power, necessarily any prestige yet, but will they always be among the youngest generation in society. No, they are going to, you know, I'm not going to say they're going to elevate because we would just continue to draw additional types of relationships here because this person is eventually going to do this, which will eventually lead to this, right? Okay, and so now we have, you know, additional generations. Now, in our society, let me, let me say, let me do this to change it from a Yanomami example that we're using to our own society. So in our society, um, households, people, how should I word this? In our society, adults are allowed to have multiple spouses, right? But they have to, it has to happen one at a time. Yeah, you have to be divorced already. So for instance, this could be a picture of people in our society, but we would have to have a divorce for, for another marriage to happen. So here's how you show a divorce or a dissolved union, okay? 
So now all of a sudden I have done this so that we can now say that this would fit our particular culture, the United States in industrialism. Okay, so when this happens in a household in the United States, do these people, do all four of these people still live together? Not the assumption, the assu yeah, not generally. The assumption is that when this, what had not happened yet, the assumption was that these people live in the same household, right? Or cooperate in the same household. When this happens, the assumption is these four people are not living in the same household in the same way that they did before. Maybe there is shared custody or whatever. That's an economic, that's a, a way of economic cooperation. There's child support, there's alimony, there's these things that are exchanged so that economic cooperation can still occur, but in a different, following a different custom, a different format, right? So over here, um, this person would most likely live full-time with this person, and then when this happens, is it our custom, is it our economic way for these people to live in the same household with these people? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know if y'all followed me or not, because I didn't know if you were looking at all, the, at all the pointing I was doing. So, okay, so the quick answer is no. It's not typically an economic behavior for these people to live... Well, these people would live in the same household together until this happens, and customarily, these people would live in a different household with, you know, independently of these people in the future. That's typically our economic cooperation pattern. But have y'all heard lately in society, when I say lately, I mean in our society in recent times, have you heard of instances where this actually, all those people live in the same household? Often. It's more and more often yeah, these days. Yeah. I think a lot of it has to do with immigration and the Hispanic. Maybe. A lot of Hispanic people have brought that culture over here. Kind of a, well, in, in other societies, yeah, I am focused on the United States, but in other cultures, um, it, you know, in Europe, for instance, we don't even have to go to Central American cultures. In Europe, for instance, um, having multiple generations of the same bloodline in the same literal dwelling for generation after generation, it ends up being 600 years of the same bloodline in that household or in that dwelling. Um, yeah, this is not an unusual picture. And regardless of whether immigrant customs and traditions are affecting the general idea of what, who, what members make up the household, a lot of Estadounidense people are deciding to form a household with these people because the division of labor, the power, the prestige, the resources, the productive resources that are available to one household with all of these people in it is extremely high compared to if these people just tried to live on their own. So it's an economic decision. It's about relationships. Um, if we didn't say that um, forcefully enough on Monday or whenever that was when we talked about Chapter 6 for the first time, economics is a behavior science. It's about human relationships. Some of you are looking at this picture and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't imagine having to live with mom and dad when I have a family of my own and I want authority and I want respect and how would that play out in this relationship, right? I mean, it is not part of um, United States culture historically but maybe because of economic conditions on the macro scale, maybe it is a great solution for um, an economic relationship or the smallest unit, you know, the smallest economic unit of society to be multiple generations, especially in a money-driven culture like ours, right? Okay, so let's think about that for just a second and how economics is definitely an exchange it's an exchange process. You know, economics is the customs associated with how do you make decisions about allocating resources and, and production, distribution, and consumption, right? We have these very official sounding words, and it is. You know, those are official um, terms that go with this. But this is much more about human relationships. Relationships of power, relationships of prestige, division of labor decisions. And so let's talk about a fundamental philosophical concept that is at the core of all economic decisions or all ec economizing behavior um, to try to help, I hope it will help you see the, um, the behavior science aspect of economic decisions, okay? And so keep these unusual household um, 
combinations that maybe are not the typical, let me put air quotes around the word typical, they're not the typical people you think of in a household in United States culture, but let's think about the economic benefits and the drawbacks of this. And remember, economics does not just mean money, okay? It's about human relationships. Questions or anything while I'm erasing? Okay, so the philosophical concept that goes with economics is called reciprocity. Okay? Reciprocity. Reciprocity, just defined by itself without an adjective in front of it, you can think of it as a give and take. The word reciprocity means that a give and take is happening among different parties or between different parties. It can be just two people, it can be groups of people, but there is a give and take. And the idea is that it's a mutual give and take, okay? So a mutual give and take um, between parties. I'll say people. Between people, whether it's individual people or peoples in a culture, one culture or the next. And I think I'm remembering now, Renee, were you talking about the mother-child relationship in, on Monday? Did you have a comment about that on Monday? Somebody did. Maybe it was my other class. Uh, yeah, that was me. Is that you? Okay. Oh, that's right. Yes, okay, about elder care. So it wasn't about like parent, little child care. It was like adult child. Well, I said, I take, you know, we take care of them now, so surely, because we were talking about okay, how, okay. how you provide for your, how the elders provide for themselves whenever they're, you're older and they're not able to produce their food. Okay, so let's keep that, yes. So let's keep that concept in mind. So um, let's look at, let's start by examining this elder care, like when you get older and you're not capable of doing all the same productive activities that you did in society before, like who's responsible for your care, right? And the answer to that question is going to be a very different answer depending upon what subsistence strategy your culture is a part of. But at the core of any of those different ways of, of answering that question, at the core is a concept called reciprocity. So here's just the general definition of reciprocity, and here is the type of reciprocity that exists with the parent-little child relationship, okay? It's called generalized reciprocity. Generalized reciprocity is a give and take, but it's not mutual. It's very one-sided. It's, so it is an exchange in which one side is always the giver and the other side is always the taker. So generalized reciprocity is an economic exchange process that sometimes governs that economic system of production, distribution, and consumption, okay? So for instance, in foragers, foragers, <clears throat> th these kinds of societies, these kinds of groups, this is an excellent example of a cultural group in general that usually operates under generalized reciprocity. We have talked a lot about division of labor already among foragers. Females usually have the gathering activities, which isn't necessarily always limited to plants. It can, sometimes can be you're gathering lizards, you're gathering grub worms, you're gathering lots of different kind of animal protein sources, maybe. <clears throat> Whereas the division of labor in foraging typically, not 100% of the time, but typically, is that the males do the hunting the larger game kind of stuff, the uh, fishing activities and stuff like this, okay? 
So, among foragers, if females go out to gather grub worms, when they come back to the village, are they going to keep all those grub worms for themselves, or what did we say happens? Mm -hmm. They went and got those grub worms to begin with to provide calories to everybody in the village, from the very small child who is eating solid food now, all the way up to the most elderly person in the village who really can't do anything other than child care and help with knowledge and passing knowledge down in the enculturation process, which is very valuable, right? It's a very valuable resource that that elderly person can do. So generalized reciprocity is, okay, if I am a female who has that productive capacity, I am of the age group and I'm fit enough to be able to go and do my gathering activities, I always know that I'm obligated to do those gathering activities and I always know that there's people back at the, ca at the camp who cannot participate in those activities for me, with me, but I'm doing it for all. And in my enculturation process, the thought would never occur to me that somebody needed to get up off their rear end and get their own food. Right? Or some other more forceful word that you might want to put in there. Right? So that thought might occur to some of us in this society who maybe say, we don't want welfare to happen because you need to get up off your bleep and go earn your own money for food. That concept doesn't occur in foraging because their exchange process that you learn in your enculturation process is characterized by generalized reciprocity. You learn in your enculturation process that this is just how it is. There's no alteration to it because, again, food is one of these things that is considered to be a human right. You're a human, you get food. All right, so we don't like withhold it from people based on their productive capacity. It's distributed among all because all need to consume. Not everybody necessarily needs to consume at the same rate. So I go out and I gather these grub worms, and the three-year-old who's eating solid food won't need as many grub worms as I need because I went and walked the two miles there and back and expended those calories. So, so the distribution is not necessarily going to be exactly even all the time. The consumption is not going to be exactly even all the time. But the productive resources are done by one group for the benefit of all. And that's characteristic of foraging. So I mentioned, though, at the very beginning that this characterizes the parent and the young child relationship. Do you agree with me? Who would be the giver always, and who would be the receiver always? Mostly makes you think of like a mother and a child, since the mother always... Just the mother? You're going to... You're well, going to be saying, sexist about it? No, no, no. I'm <laughs> saying that normally, general, that's what generally comes to mind is the mother, because the mother's been... The, the mother family. has that, in the division of labor, yeah. the caregiver is the mother. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Well, and from the very beginning, the mother feeds the baby, and so that she has to be... The you mean, like, literally with She's her... Literally doing, yeah. Yes, but maybe, you know... If you're in the Yanomami, and, you, and we saw an economic decision happening when we read that Yanomami piece of a breastfeeding mother, and she made a very economic decision, right. economizing behavior right about for whether... Child, right, for the child that she was given, for the, the parent-child relationship, the mother was the one giving to that child, because she was the one nursing that child. Yes, but where did she get her food to produce the milk? Well, I mean, right? I mean, there's a yeah. bigger cycle, right? Like we, yeah. so I'm just asking this because there is a bigger cycle, but yes, we have the mother as the caregiver role in the division of labor for a kind of a biologically determined reason, generally. right? Okay, generally. It doesn't have to be that way, right? Okay, so in generalized reciprocity, this exchange that's one-sided <laughs> is always going to be like, like this. There is never any assumption that the roles are going to be reversed, Okay. So you need to include that. There's never any assumption by either side. Never any assumption that the roles will reverse. And that's where this topic of the elderly parent and the adult child comes in. So, let me just wait, y'all are busily writing, so I'll wait for a second. 
So the parent in our society, mother if you want to be more specific, um, but the parent in general is expected in our society to take care of the child when the child <laughs> is not able to take care of themselves, right? Expected. Now, um, there might be, as a matter of fact, there is, I think it's Time Magazine or maybe Life Magazine, I can't remember which magazine, but once every five years or so, maybe once every ten years, there is an article about how much it costs after inflation, this, you know, this period of years, how much does it cost to bring a child into the world and get them to the 18th birthday? And there's like a, you know, an assumption about your standard of living and how much the standard of living, the basic things in standard of living cost, and how much it costs to, you know, to bring a kid from zero years to 18 years. And the last time I checked, it, it's something you can easily Google, but the last time I checked, it's something like $275,000 for a, like a working class, middle class lifestyle in our, in our society. So, um... So there are people who calculate, in other words, exactly how much input it costs. And I think that that's just money input. It doesn't consider, you know, it doesn't itemize, for instance, that your kid is 13 and they're in the soccer league now and you need to drive, you know, it doesn't calculate, yeah, the, like the chauffeur costs and stuff. It's like literally food and medical care and stuff like this. Yeah, so um, it doesn't calculate cheerleading camp, I don't think. You know, those kinds of extra costs. But anyway, um, there's generally this idea that if you have a child, that's your responsibility. That's your economic responsibility. And do we really, to bring this conversation back into play about elder care, is there really a custom in our enculturation process in the United States where we teach our children who we are doing this for do we teach our children that the expectation is that in the future the roles will be reversed? Yeah. We I do? Think it I think I was going to say it's become more too. common. Yeah. It's become more common what? That, you know, the elder expects you to take care of them. Really? Because nursing homes and assisted living facilities have boomed in the last decade. I mean, you've got people building high-rise assisted living centers because there's not any more land to expand this way, so they're expanding up. And those assisted living places are for elderly people, not for youth. I'm just saying for my participant yeah, observation, like, it was, it's more of a thing where, like, everybody I've known, the elders are always about, no, I'm not going to a nursing home, but you take care of me. Maybe I'm that's different in your generation. I mean, clearly. I mean, it depends on that's what I'm just saying. In I think I it depends, depends, it depends on religion and race. Dynamics. In yeah. my culture, Hispanics, they take care of... So you're calling Hispanic a race? See, I wouldn't call Hispanic a race. I'd call it an ethnicity. Yeah. Okay, well, in the Hispanic race or whatever, yeah. they take care of the elders. Like, they don't send them to a, you know, a nursing home. Yes. Like, I used to work in a nursing home and you just see, like, whites and, like, you know, guys and all that. Never Hispanic, never, like, you know. And I feel like, just as a Hispanic, I know that I have to take care of her mom whenever she gets... Okay, so it was in your enculturation process that it was built into the expectation. Yes. But then, so the... I think it can also be a learned behavior, though, because I... My, my oldest, I mean, obviously, I'm not Hispanic, but my oldest child is very diverse, I guess, into the Hispanic culture, and she has been since she was four. And so most of our close family friends are Hispanic, or... I guess because we see that, like that's why I know so many families that live in different generations in one home, and to me that's not strange, like that just happens, and I know a lot of people who take in their parents, and I mean people who even bring them over once they get to where they can take care of themselves. Is there any they expectation that they are going to get something from it, no. or is it a pay is that's it the idea of a payback? take care of them. In my so generation... In my generation, it was not like that. In my generation, Estado and Idense, right, like not a Hispanic background or anything. Um, in my generation, there was no expectation that the roles would ever reverse. The expectation was I was going to be a consumer, a producer only insofar as like they gave me chores to do. Right? You know, yes, I would have to produce economic benefit for my household, that unit, if I was given the chore to mow the grass or sweep the garage or put away the dishes or fold the laundry or whatever it is. Like, that is an economic contribution, too. It might not have a price tag. I did not get allowance to do it. I was allowed to breathe, you know, and occupy a room, you know, to, to do that kind of thing. But there was never any assumption that as I got older, 
one of us, and I came from a big, big family, a big Catholic family, so it, we had many ethnic similarities to Hispanic culture, um, but there was never any expectation that I remember anybody ever told me, are you going to take care of Papa when I get older? You know, when I was little? Yeah. It also really, it really depends because I have, like, once in what they're talking about, of course, the Spanish as well. And of course, like, my mother spent drum music, saying, of course, that she took care of me since birth and all like. So you have that message? She's giving you that message? Yeah, that, of course, you know, that, um, that she said she took care of us and all that stuff. You know, we have to repay her that same favor that we have to take her in. That really depends because, like I said, you know, my, my parents, my mother, and my father, well, my father has this ongoing issue that his grandfather, well, not my grandfather, Dad, of course, you know, he takes care of his dad, and his sisters take care of his, of his, of his mother. And it's a really different thing, because my mom was giving me the lesson, saying that because he told me about my, my grandfather's past and afterwards, and things, and, you know, that wasn't important to me, it was just how, you know, things that, you know, he believed. That she know. wouldn't approve of or something. Yeah, saying yeah. That, that this is why, you know, you must learn from your grandfather and my dad, because my dad, of course, you know, she's telling me about the same thing to him, since she's the only one that's taking, I'm not saying only one, but of course, she is taking care of us. She, provides, she gets the most credit in my dad. So therefore, she's giving me the message that, see? You're uh, obligated in the future. So then this payback thing, at, at least in your personal experience, and your personal experience, and we're going to generalize that to say that you think probably it's a safe bet to, to generalize that and say in Hispanic cultures in general, well, I'm saying that, 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 is a, that, that that there is the idea of payback later yeah, on. Yeah, but you know, it just depends. Because like I said, you know, what my... But it's a gender thing. You're describing even yeah. more complicated. It's a gender thing. Yeah, because of course you know, it has to do with you know with emotions as well. Because like I said, like uh, my my mom, you know, she tell tell me about my my grandfather and stuff. How you know my, my dad takes so care of So don't do kids. this. Do that. Yeah, because of course, like mm -hmm. well, I don't know where I'm going right now. But of course, you know, like uh, with my with my grandpa, you know, she's giving me a lesson about him because of, with my dad right now, he's not putting much attention to us, and so because he has that attention, like above to another generation i'm doing above yeah. because i'm thinking of he like how you would draw he this with those kinship different than us. yeah and so therefore you know my grandpa she's giving the lesson on him because he's lonely most of the most of my oh they don't i take, see they, they don't pay attention to him and so therefore he gets really lonely over there they're still well they're divorced mm -hmm. anyway they live they live different homes that's why that's why my sister to my my dad so there's like two family. different yeah, yeah. Okay, so that is, a, that is a very interesting change that probably is exactly the reason that you see multiple generations in the same household so much more often this day and age than you did when I was a 20-something or when I was, you know, growing up and little. But so it's so interesting to me that you get these messages, like your mother's like reading you a bedtime story or something and saying, won't you take care of mama when I'm older or something, right? You know, that is not a typical United Statesian message um, for, for people to get. And like you said, you know, the nursing home has maybe like one demographic or two demographics in it or something. You want to say something? Oh, I was just thinking, it just what he was saying reminded me that um, my dad kind of did something similar, which is surprising because I'm, I'm not going to lie, we're, you know, white family, white is very <laughs> Caucasian. Um, he always joked about, now, Hunter, when you get rich, don't forget about me. Oh, please, okay. Please take care of me, please. Did he ever say it's because how much you cost me? No. No? <laughs> well, because that's the general, that's the idea with generalized reciprocity. Like, there might be, so now, maybe there is this message, and I actually like what I'm hearing. Like, I really like the idea that, um, because th that is not a typical behavior in industrialized society that is so focused on productive resources. Like, if you're not a productive member of the household, what kind, like, how does that characterize the reciprocity? I mean, in my household, for instance, my my elderly father lives with me and he is he has dementia he's extremely feeble he can do nothing but eat and make a huge mess and not clean up after himself and sleep and not ever even put the sheets on the bed you know he can't make up his bed or do any of those kinds of norm norms for like household behavior he can't even always make it to the bathroom on time right and he can't clean himself if he doesn't make it to the bathroom on. you know so there's those are the kinds of things that a baby does Right? And when you have a baby, 
if they throw food on the wall, oh, ha, ha, don't do it again. And like, there's hope that it's going to change. And if they poop in their pants, oh, darn it, let me go, let's go change. Or let's get, let's get baby cleaned up. Or if they can't make up their own bed, like there's an idea. But as, I wonder, as this progresses, um, how much reciprocity are adult children going to be able to give up, is that the right word, um, when there's not hope for improvement in an elderly person, there's only the promise of increased decline and then, you know, death eventually. Yeah. So it is an interesting, so your dad was like, when you win the scratch off or whatever, when you get wealthy, well, he wasn't remember saying that. what I he, did to, he's, for he's, you. He's very hopeful about my career because he's like yeah well yeah it's good okay good. you know so wishful thinking well, not exactly wishful like he knows you know how yeah what you're capable of basically, basically, where you're going with your life i think part of it is the fact that he also was an artist but he never got to have do that dream job so he's kind of basically saying hey i hope you get it I'm and you when you do, you when you do, take yeah. care of your old dad. Yes, I understand. Okay, so anyway, that's an interesting concept to kind of um, think about and to discuss and maybe even, you know, talk about, here's a crazy idea, talk about anthropology outside of anthropology class and, like, see what other people think about this balanced reciprocity, or, excuse me, generalized reciprocity idea. Do kids today in general, or is it separated by ethnic, ethnic lifestyle, do kids today in general have the idea that it's their responsibility, like social responsibility, to take care of the older generation when, um, you know, when that time comes, it's an interesting concept. Interesting. Okay, so um, balanced reciprocity. This is another type of the give and take that we're talking about, but instead of one-sided, like general reciprocity says, what do you suppose <coughs> I'm going to say about the give and the take in balanced reciprocity? They give and take equally. The expectation in balanced reciprocity is that there is a giver and there is a taker, but the expect if you're the giver and you give, you're giving with the expectation that whoever received is going to give you equal. It doesn't have to be identical. We did not use the word identical. But it's going to give you equal time or effort or consideration or money value if you want to throw, you know, the um, the currency kind of um, idea in here. But balanced is equivalent um, give and take. Equivalent give and take. This is the expectation. I before E. So is this how you spell receive? The giver will receive. Is that how you spell receive? EI? Yeah. Okay. So the expectation that the giver will receive eventually, um, and you know, or the roles will reverse. Let's just say that the roles will reverse. Okay. So balanced reciprocity. Again, let's talk about human relationships. Which human relationships does this um, does this characterize? Balanced reciprocity. Husband and wife. <laughs> oh, okay, good. There we go. Husband and wife, or um, lovers in general, or best friends in general, or what about that household we had drawn up here in the Yanomami household? Um, uh, we said that the division of labor was very different. The males were producing the bulk of the <coughs> calorie sources, and the females had an obligation also to the household. Child care, child production, food production, distribution, consumption, that kind of stuff. Um, so there is a, a general idea that you are worthwhile in, in the Yanomami, okay? There's this general idea that, okay, I am giving the specific thing that I am giving, but I expect you to give the specific thing that you can give so that this relationship can stay solid and move forward, right? So there's an economic relationship in, in that particular household having to do with husbands and wives, but why did y'all say husbands and wives so, so quickly? Well, see, the wife gives food to the husband, the husband gives money to the wife to be able to buy the groceries or whatever is needed, no? But I, 
So, right. so when and you also look at with children too, like with the head player wife dealing with the children, um, I mean, generally the mom does a lot more of the caring, I guess. But a lot, of, I mean, in my home, it's very balanced. And uh, well, we have three kids, so we have to split up with the divide and conquer. We say that all the time. And my husband actually has a shirt that says, um, "I don't babysit, I parent." Because so oh. many people will ask, "Where's your husband?" And I'm like, "He's at home." Or where's your child at home with her dad? Oh, is he babysitting? No. He's no, the he's dad. the dad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's he's ba- okay. Children. Yeah. So and the so the general idea here that I that y'all seem to be both saying is in the traditional gender roles that we have or that we know of in our society, with the traditional gender roles, if whether it is equal child attention time, like you're talking about, dividing and conquering because you have multiple children that need attention and y'all do it, that's the way you balance it. Or the way Paula described it too was not equal division of labor, Whereas we have these kids and we're both going to do the same jobs having to do with these kids. Right. But the, but that's, so we're still talking about like traditional gender roles because with yours is, okay, if the father or the male is the, here's a, here's a gender role for you, breadwinner, right? Provider. The provider or the breadwinner. So if the provider brings home the bacon, you've heard that phrase before, right? Brings home the bacon, brings home the money, um, brings home the resources, the spendable resources for the society, then the traditional gender role of the wife is you are going to produce this kind of economic equivalent for the household. You're going to cook, maybe clean, maybe grocery shop. What were some of the other examples? You have children, take care of the children, right? I would nurse the children and then he would bathe the children. So that way we both have one-on-one time with them, but you obviously can't Right, and so those kinds of relationships, if it became unbalanced, if you have no help. The past two weeks. Oh, that's it's right, tough. he's been out, yeah. It's really <laughs> You've been out of- I'm a terrible single mom. I will be the first to admit it. My kids have been neglected. <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, so yeah, but if early on he lived in the household with you, but didn't contribute so that you felt valued, people can feel unvalued. At this time, if a husband brings home, like in, to use your example again, if a husband brings home money or that kind of value to a household and the house is always dirty and the wife never has any babies or refuses to or doesn't cook and you have to go out to eat all the time, like there is an imbalance that is going to damage that human relationship. Abs- you should think of friendships yeah. also. There's another human relationship. If I call you my best friend, but I'm the one who always needs something from you, whether it's a ride to work or a shoulder to cry on or I need to stay with you for two weeks or the money for... Here. Uh-oh, sorry. I don't mean to get too personal, but you- right. Like what would happen to our friendship if that was always me, the needy one, Always you expecting, I expect you to give it to me, and then you need to vent with me and have my shoulder to cry on. You need to borrow 20 bucks from me, and I'm never there for you. How long are we going to be BFFs? Not long. Yeah. And this is so generalized, but I think a lot of late teens, early 20s, we're in a generation that has given incredibly unrealistic expectations of what friendship should be, and they're taught what to expect, but they're not taught what to give. Why, so why do they have, um, and where are they getting unrealistic like, I don't see, It's kind of like the media. Yeah, the media I think a lot of it's social media. And things like that, relationship goals. Yeah. Are you talking about like, it's, like it's being more romanticized? Yes, for everything is, basically. Really? See, I don't do, isn't it terrible? I study people and human behavior, and I don't do social media very much. Like, you, know, you know the social media I use the most? Blackboard learning system. <laughs> like, that's on social media. I'm sorry. It's a really good thing you don't like study some of the people on social media. It's, it's kind of sad. Well, a lot of social scientists do. Like a lot of communication experts and, and linguistic anthropologists and cultural anthropologists well, said to myself, like that might be some people's focus. It's just they don't not have mine. very many solid, substantial relationships, and a lot of it starts with they don't have that with their parents. They don't know how to have that with their siblings. Oh, they we're getting into some social psychology here, too, right? Well, that's yeah. not a lot of the... We so, unbalanced. <laughs> it's unbalanced because they're not taught how to make sure to keep it balanced. So, ba- the balanced reciprocity, though, you're right. Like, like the foundation for yeah. 
the foundation for all human relationships, like even sibling relationships, right? right? I mean, sibling, that's a family relationship, but we did not say that siblings have a relationship called generalized reciprocity. We have balanced reciprocity. Like, now little sister might not fulfill big sister in the same way that big sister fulfills little sister. But as long as there is equivalent, see, we used the word equivalent, not exactly equal. Just like with the husband and wife with traditional gender roles, if he is the provider and she is the caregiver, as long as the providing and the caregiving don't get out of whack, don't get out of balance, that can be a very long, successful relationship. Do you realize that what we have just said, the conclusion that we have just come to in class without even really realizing it, is that marriage, that kind of relationship, friends, that kind of relationship, these are economic relationships. When you decide to keep me as a friend or drop me as a friend, um, you are making, that is economizing behavior. I'm going to put effort into this friendship or into this boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, whatever it is, or I'm not because I'm not getting out that cost analysis kind of that I'm doing. More people break up in the United States, anybody want to guess what week of the year in the United States more people break up? February? What? Christmas. She got, yeah. So the week before oh, Valentine's Day the week before. is the highest number of breakups. The week after Valentine's Day is the second highest number of breakups. Look at the definition of this and maybe give me some speculation about why. Isn't the girl breakup? The, the week before, why, why the week before would you expect so many breakups? Because we know the custom, the custom is an economic exchange. There is an expectation on St. Valentine's, it's a saint, by the way. <laughs> uh, so on Valentine's Day, there, the assumption is you have to produce some kind of thing that makes the other person feel special. And if I just am not so into you, and therefore I'm just not going to fork over the time or the effort or the cash or whatever, because I'm just not that into you to begin with, there's an economic decision. A breakup is an economic decision. After St. Valentine's Day, the breakups can happen again because of balanced reciprocity. I have given this person these last months of my life, and I just didn't feel valued by what they put into me for this particular day that is set aside to recognize your lover as the number one person in your life. I was not made to feel the number one person in your life. Goodbye. So it's about balanced reciprocity, these, these relationships. Um, you will maintain or um, break up a relationship based on the, whether there is a balance or not. Um, friendships are like this, and it's also balanced reciprocity can also affect power between people. Power between people or groups. For instance, how many of y'all do like um, Dirty Santa? Not, well, yeah, Dirty Santa, you have like a, a price that you can't go over 10 bucks or something, you can't go over 20 bucks. Secret Santa. Santa. Secret Santa. I want to be Dirty Santa. Dirty Santa is the secret. You do Secret Santa, but then you steal the gifts from each other. There is a there is yeah, like a game. Dirty Santa is fun. Like you, yeah. yeah. So you have like secret presents, and then you can steal. You open the presents in front of everybody, and then somebody can steal it from you. So yeah, Secret Santa. So if you have like forty people to buy for, um, which if you have tons of cousins and all this kind of stuff, that can happen, right? So if you have tons of people to buy for, maybe the rule is that everybody makes a homemade present, or maybe the rule is that no presents are over five bucks or something, right? So those rules are centered around balanced reciprocity. So what if the rule is everybody has to do a $5 present, but somebody's present is clearly a $65 present? Is that a power play? Could it be interpreted as a power play? They think they're so snotty or they think they're better than us or something like this. Think about those kinds of exchanges. I know someone who, for instance, when her kids were in like second, third grade, the custom in that third grade class was for all the boys to invite all the other boys to every birthday party that any boy had. So it wasn't just like your two BFFs come to your birthday party. If there's 10 boys in the class, all 10 boys always came to the class. 
And she started keeping, the mother of that little boy started keeping a list. When he went to Noah's birthday party, he gave Noah blah. So when Noah is invited to Isaiah's birthday party, Noah is going to give something almost equivalent to what, I mean, she was really detailed, much more detailed than I would ever be. But I asked her about this. I was in Walmart with her one time when she pulled her list out because, oh, Noah's going to a birthday party next week and I need to get something for the little kid. Let me see what he gave Noah when he came to Noah's. And so I asked this question. Why do you need to check that? Well, we don't want the parents and we don't want the kids to feel like Noah is trying to make a statement by the present that he gives. If he gives him too inexpensive of a present, well then he's cheap and you know he doesn't respect, back to the power is power and prestige also, doesn't respect my kid as much as he respected him. Or if he gives an overly expensive present, is he trying to say that he's better than the next person? Is that a power play and is there a message there? There can be symbolism in, just like the symbolism, if you did not get the value of a present at St. Valentine's Day that you thought you deserved because of the input you had, and you might break up the relationship for that, could imbalancing, intentionally imbalancing the reciprocity, can it send a message too? I don't value you as much as you valued me or I think I'm better than you, and here's evidence because my present that I gave you is way better than you gave me. And I even said that with my little kid attitude, right? So it could, um, so balanced reciprocity, it's, it's, the, it's the foundation of every human relationship except for, um, except for two the parent-child, and then also, the next time we see each other, we will talk about negative reciprocity and finish up, we'll finish up the chapter six, negative reciprocity and um, how that characterizes the grandparent, like traditional grandparent role, not the grandparent that actually acts as the daily caregiver like so often we have in our society today, but the traditional grandparent role and the traditional grandchild role something called negative reciprocity. So we will talk about that next week. Good discussion today. I liked that. that was good.